Today we're going to be looking at a subject that um, came about as a result of um, last week. So just to kind of give you a little bit of context, last week we had our mission team that just returned from, from Europe, more specifically from Germany, and uh, we all sat up here and, and kind of gave little testimonies of what God did, and Pastor had asked me, in the event that things run short, would you prepare a word, uh, it, just in case that happens? And so I did, and I was like, man, like the best case scenario, I'm going to have I'm going to have 10 minutes. Like, that's like if everything goes according to, like, everybody's really short, um, it would be 10 minutes. And so I was like, all right, Lord, give me a word. I need a 10-minute word. And he gave me a 45-minute word. <laughs> so I was like, Lord, that's not going to work. Um, but it was okay because everybody took all the time up anyways, and I wasn't able to share it. But uh, I get to share that today. And so... We came back from Germany, and as we were ministering there, I had realized that there are, many, there are many truths that are just simply vacant, and they're gone over there. And today, we're going to be looking at a biblical truth that is absolutely essential to our faith. I want to be clear, though. I'm not preaching a message to an American church or to Harvest Hill Church that actually belongs to be and, and is supposed to only be preached in Europe because I believe that this truth is also being eroded away in our culture, in our day, in our country, in our city. And so I want to encourage you that this is not just for them, it is also for you. If you would, please open up your Bibles to Psalms 96. Psalms 96. Once you get there, um, put, a book, put a bookmark there, put a ribbon there. Um, we're going we're gonna to actually come to that quite a bit later. Um, you can put a bookmark there and then just close the Bible up or just cl close your phone or whatever you're using. And we'll come back to it later. There is an essential truth that is oftentimes overlooked at the point of conversion. Sometimes at the point of conversion, people just completely miss this essential foundational truth. There's this important moment of epiphany, call it a revelation, that should happen sometime before your rebirth into the kingdom of God. Some, sometimes it doesn't happen. If it didn't happen then, you should have installed it at the earliest possible moment in your discipleship process. The earliest possible moment. And if it hasn't happened still, you need to install this truth into your life in a personal way today. For some, this truth is it's obvious. Because of their unique life experience, this truth was so clear, so obvious, they grabbed it and accepted it as true, not only for themselves, but for other people, installed it into their life, and it was no problem at all. For others, it's the complete opposite. And it's so difficult, it's such a difficult concept to even get, they, they can hardly even see it, let alone grasp it and take it. I think I can say that if you're missing this fundamental truth, this building block, you are missing an important logic. There's a, there's a bit of logic that comes. There's a bit of clarity that comes that brings support to the tenets, to many tenets of our faith. And if you're missing that, um, it can be a destructive thing in your faith. It can be something that erodes at your, at your understanding of Christianity. And I think I can say that without a comprehensive understanding of this truth, you're at risk of many things. Number one, you're at risk of believing a cheap and incomplete gospel that could um, likely lead to heresy and ultimately could lead you to turn away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. If you haven't yet received this. I don't know. That's serious business. That's a serious claim. That's how serious this truth is. Number two. There's another reason. There's another, there's another thing rather that you're at risk of. Uh, if you haven't accepted and installed this truth. You're at risk of repeatedly falling into 
giving an empty, half-hearted offering of praise and worship to the Almighty and one true God. Number three, if you don't have this truth, you're at risk of never being obedient to sh- uh, the, the obedient to the commandment of Jesus to share the gospel. You're, ne- you're, never, you're, you're at risk of never being obedient to do that. Y'all interested? <laughs> Y'all want to know what it is? All right, that's all the time I've got. Let's, let's, uh... <laughs> the truth is this, that apart from Jesus, you are not good. You are not good. And it's a, it's a truth that flies in the face of the philosophy of this age. It's a truth that is so contended against that, that you would be considered um, um, a bigot or, or, or you would be considered um, somebody who has a very narrow view if, if you were to actually hold on to this truth and actually try your best to, to communicate this truth to another group of people. You see, the, the problem is, is it's a difficult thing to accept. I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say, Look, this has been difficult for me to get past and accept and install this truth into my life. It has been. It's not easy. Why? There's several things that, uh, that well, rather, there's a couple of things and reasons why this is a difficult truth to accept. Um, I think, number one, it's difficult because anytime. You have a person who is well-traveled or at least well knowledge, has a fair amount of knowledge about another group of people and another culture and another land who that isn't predominantly Christian. And you go and you experience that culture and you go and you sort of walk with them and, and have this really incredible experiences with them and you know that they don't have Jesus. It's very difficult for you to be of the mindset that apart from Jesus, they're not good. Why? Because they're a beautiful culture. They're, they, they have many good redeeming qualities. They, ha- they do good all around them. But I'm here to tell you that they're not good. Apart from Jesus, they're not good. My seasoned Christians in this room know exactly the doctrine I'm preaching of right now. It's called the doctrine of original sin. And it's something that is being attacked in our society. And we can't let go of it. We can't not let go of it. It's difficult to accept many times. The scripture that I'm referencing is Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none that is good. Actually, I think Paul uses the word righteous if you're looking at the New King James. There is none that is righteous. No, not one. There's a hindrance to accepting this truth. The hindrance is something, it kind of comes out of left field. The hindrance is compassion. It's, it's a little bit of, a, of, of something I've been praying about and seeking God on and asking him about. But the issue is that people have been given a God-given compassion. And that God-given compassion is the very thing that, that is a hindrance to them accepting this truth to be true of other people. They're not good. What? They seem to be good. They're not all that different than me and my friends. We do good things and we do bad things. Just because they haven't yet heard the gospel of Jesus, the Lord is going to punish them with eternal, uh, with, with eternal damnation, with eternal uh, resting place of hell. That seems unfair. Doesn't seem right. Church, God isn't punishing them for not hearing the gospel. That's not the truth. The truth is, is they are sinful 
and their right judgment is what God says it is. They're not being punished for not having heard the gospel of Jesus. Don't get that into your mind. It's difficult to accept. It's a hard truth to actually, it's one thing to kind of hear it and sort of not think about it too much because it's difficult to think about and we don't really want to to think negatively about God or anything like that. But I'm going to tell you, church, it's important that you settle this in your mind. It's very important. Hopefully this helps you. Hopefully this helps you get, get to where you are, maybe that people aren't so bad, they're not so different than, than me, to all the way to where God is, where he says none is good, not one. Bad people have the ability to do good things. I knew there was going to be like such a silence that there was going to be like the ability to hear a pin drop in this room. I knew that this was going to happen with this type of a word, but the Lord put this on my heart so strong. This is such a foundational point to our faith that if you don't have it, you're, you're missing. You're, there are large gaps in your understanding in terms of the gospel. We cannot, we cannot simply uh, have these massive gaps. We have to accept these things. Bad people have the ability to do good things. Did you guys know that the infamous Adolf Hitler, he actually passed laws that prevented animal cruelty. That's a good thing. Bad person. Can we all agree, even with our, even with our lack of willingness to call other people bad, right? We have a, we're very apprehensive in calling other people bad. And we'll get to that in a little bit as to the reasons why. But we're, we're, we're not eager to agree with God's statement that everyone is not good. We're eager, rather, to find the good in people and call them good. We can all agree Adolf Hitler's bad, but he did a good thing. Illustrates the point that bad people can do good things. Ted Bundy, before becoming a serial killer, um, actually volunteered at a suicide prevention hotline. Now, I know that's a little (laughs) sketchy, right? But from what I understand, it was actually, he actually try, was trying to help. He's a bad person. Al Capone, the, uh, the pro- prohibition era booze running gangster that um, would get in open gunfights on the streets and kill the police and kill innocent bystanders along the way. Did you know that he, he opened up many soup kitchens across the streets of Chicago? During the height of the Depression, he served, he, his, his kitchen served over 120,000 hot meals during the height of the Depression. Pablo Escobar, the, uh, the cocaine king of Medellin, he did many good things. He opened up youth outreach centers in Medellin. He, he, uh, he built soccer stadiums for the youth to be able to play in. Listen, church, bad people can do good things. Just because a, a person has the capacity to do something good doesn't mean that they're not inherently sinful, as God puts forward. It doesn't mean that their soul isn't actually corrupted, as God says it is. Why is it possible for a bad person to do a good thing? Because God's law is written on the hearts of men. The Bible tells us that the law of God is written on the hearts of men. And there is a strong force that compels people to do the right thing in the right moment. As a matter of fact, I believe that even as individuals come together to try to create a society, God's law then becomes self-evident to them. As we bring together a society, we can all agree it's probably bad to steal, to lie, to cheat, to do all these kinds of things as God puts forward, yet it becomes self-evident. Those are good things that people can do uh, because God's moral and ethic is powerful. It doesn't mean that they're not inherently sinful as God's put forward. God has given you your compassion. 
And I actually think that there is a, there is this internal struggle that happens whenever we're having to accept this truth that is true of others. We don't want to be judgmental. As a matter of fact, as Christians, we feel like we're called to not be judgmental. You're not being judgmental. You're agreeing with the one true righteous judge who is holy, whose judgments are like honey, the Bible says. It's not... It's not being judgmental to agree with the judge. There is none that is good. Not one. Everyone is corrupted. Everyone is. Apart from Jesus. If you look across the landscape of the earth... And you put yourself to the task of evaluating the souls of humanity. And you see that people are good, or they can do, they can do good, therefore they must be good. And then you try to take that logic and reconcile it against the truth and the, uh, the judgment and the, the justice of God. You are putting yourself in a very precarious spiritual position people do this Christians do this and I'm not saying that it's wrong to do it I'm saying the way in which you go about this very precarious thing you need to be very careful about having accepted and installed these truths before you endeavor to make this uh, (laughs) this spiritual walk with the Lord Because if you haven't, you're very likely putting yourself in a position to judge God. If you were here during the Freedom Conference, you may have heard me speak about this very subject. You see, Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And then we broke down really qu- in just a really quick way, I want to say, that the, what they received when they did eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil wasn't knowledge. They didn't receive any new scientific facts. They didn't receive any new bits of information that they didn't already have. What they received is totally hinged to the second part of the name of the tree, of good and evil. They received a position that they were never meant to have, which is a position of judgment. Good and evil is an inherently judgmental way. And so as what they did with their very first judgment that they were never supposed to have, as they took the first bite, they judged God and found that he wasn't being true to them. And as we look at God's word and as we're trying to install the truth that none is good, not one, and then we take this idea that because people do good, therefore they must be good, and then we say, God, how could you possibly bring about a judgment on people that are good? You, sir, you, madam, are out of your depth. Be very careful because he is God. And he is the judge. Do not dethrone God because you think you know better. We are either subjects to God or we are gods ourselves. Those are the only two options. We have decided when we gave our life to Jesus that we are no longer God. And I am subject to the truth of who God is and what he does on the earth. I am a Christian. I submit to the authority of God. Be very careful. Because to venture onto that spiritual endeavor and come up in the wrong place you are at an extreme risk of accepting heresy. You are very close to accepting universalism 
you were very close to, to taking on humanism and saying that people can get to God apart from Jesus. Why? Because they're good. They're not good. Just like you're not good. There's a couple of reasons why this is difficult to accept. I want to pause and make a clarifying statement here really quickly. Am I saying that you can never call somebody good? That's not what I'm saying. The context of this discussion is dealing with eternity. All right? The standard that is set by God as to who is good and who is not good. Now, when the standard shifts and we're talking about recommending somebody for a job, the standards completely changed, right? Well, this is a good person. They'd be great for that job. Or maybe you're recommending a, a, one of your best girlfriends for your, your husband's friend that uh, he knows and you're trying to make, play ma matchmaker or whatever the case may be. The standard is different. Uh, you can say that she's a great person. I think y'all would really get along. I'm not saying that there's never an appropriate time and place to call somebody good. I'm saying that in the scope of heaven, when we're talking about such lofty things, we have to shift and understand that there's a different standard that is being put forward, and it's a different question altogether as to whether somebody is good or not good. And it helps to, to facilitate, it helps to um, bolster up and make sense of our faith. You guys with me? You understand what I'm saying? It's very important to get this down into your heart. There's another reason that this truth is very difficult to accept for some. It's one thing to accept it in a sort of abstract way, as we've been talking about so far, as being true for others, that sometimes our God-given compassion is a, is a hindrance against. But for many, it's an altogether different thing to accept it to be true about you. <laughs> After all, if Paul says that none is good, not one, that includes me. It includes you. It can be tough for, I mentioned earlier in the beginning that some people get it right away. It's not hard for them. They've been carrying the burden of sin for so long. They've been, they've been dealing with uh, carrying this, this weight of sin and they've seen that the product of sin is death and they, they've experienced it with their life and when they went to the cross, they, off, they offloaded their sin and then felt the freedom that came as a result of it and they looked back at their old life and said, yes, that is bad. Like, it's so easy for some. They're like, yeah, easy. I was, I'm, I'm a bad person. Yeah, I get it. For others who feel like they haven't made very many mistakes, it can be difficult. This truth is so, especially with the, with the philosophy of this age, just, just railing against this. You get one hour in church, you get all the other hours with, with, with the world. There is a, there is a heavy uh, aggression against this truth. And for those that feel like they just simply haven't made very many mistakes, it can be hard to take on a personal level and put it right here and say, it's true about me. I'm a bad person apart from Jesus. In Luke, there's this incredible thing that happens. It's real life, guys. It's the Bible. This is, a, this is a historical account of something that actually happened. Jesus is invited to dinner from a Pharisee. Jesus accepts the invitation. He goes to the Pharisee's house, um, and they, have, they, they, they begin to have a meal together. Now, as I put it like, 
in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, be, what happens, they must be outside like on a patio or a front porch on an outside dining table of some sort because they're eating, and as they're eating, a woman off the streets, or maybe it's a, it's a community courtyard of some kind that the house backs up against, a woman off the street comes to where Jesus is. She sees Jesus, and she comes to where he is. This woman, she, she takes her very finest oil that she has, her very valuable thing, and she, she takes it and she anoints the feet of Jesus. It's, it's common in this time to anoint the head. She, she, she anoints his feet with her finest. As she's doing this, she's on her knees at the feet of Jesus, and she begins to weep uncontrollably. And tears fall, and they fall on Jesus' feet, and she begins to clean his feet with her hair and the Pharisee says this Jesus if you were a prophet you would know that this woman is a sinner and you wouldn't let her touch you Jesus completely ignores the accusation that he's not a prophet and he goes personal he says Simon the Pharisee's name he says, Simon, I want to tell you something. Simon says, okay, I'm listening. He said, There's, there were two men. And they both owed a debt to the same banker. The first man owed a debt of 500 coins. And the second man owed a debt of 50 coins. Neither man had the ability to repay the, the banker. And then Jesus said, Simon, I want to ask you a question. He said, yes. He said, Simon, which man loved, sorry, the banker forgave the debts. I forgot that important part. The, the banker forgave both debts. He said, it's okay. Don't pay me back. And then Jesus says, which man loved the banker more? And Simon said, I, I guess the, the man who owed 500 coins. And Jesus said, yes. You're right. Now, go, growing up in church, I've heard this, I don't even know how many times. But I, if I'm being honest with you, there was something that just didn't click with me when I first heard this. And it, and it stayed with me for a long time. You see, I looked at this story and I was like, God, I mean, I owe, 50, I owe 50 pieces. Who, who loves more? The person that owes 500 pieces. Am I, am I to believe that there is a cap on my ability to love you because I owe 50 pieces? <laughs> Why have you put a ceiling on my ability to love you, Lord? What, what, why? I don't understand. And I went on not understanding for a long time, a very long time. Should I go out and, and, and sin a whole bunch? Is that what you're inviting me to do, Lord? Let me just go out and just pursue the lusts of the flesh and, and, and really get down and dirty, so to speak. Is that what I'm supposed to do? So that I might be able to owe 500 coins? Years went by, this question. It was an intellectual thing. I wasn't actually mad at God as a result of it. It was an intellectual conflict that I had. It went unanswered for years. Fast forward to a really impactful season of my life where I'm at Bible school at Christ for the Nations in Dallas. And I'm in the IB, the International Building. I'm at the front during a chapel service where the presence of the Lord is so thick and so powerful. I'm just lost in his presence. Long since forgot about this intellectual problem that I had as a teenager or whatever the case may be. No lectures recently heard on this subject. And I'm just pouring my heart out to the Lord and the Holy Spirit visits me. And it's really this impactful moment for me where he takes me by the hand. And he begins to walk me down the aisles of my memory. See, the issue with people who think that they haven't made very many mistakes 
is that we have these tendencies to, to look at the things that we've done wrong and do one of two things. We either sweep them under the rug really quickly. Nobody saw that, right? Okay. If, if, we, don't, if we don't pay attention to it, if we don't give any mental uh, uh, capacity to it, it's just going to go away. Nobody saw it. Okay, it didn't happen. Sweeping under the rug. Let's file that in, in a filing cabinet and lock the key, uh, and throw the key away, lock it and throw the key away. So we either do that or when we make mistakes, we will, we will twist the situation and we'll say, well, well, there's a reason I had to do that. And we'll take a thing that was bad and say, it's actually not bad, it's good. Because the, the, the situation called for it and we'll say the ends justifies the means. And yet we will continue to prop up our ability. Like Christ for the nations and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit just takes me by the hand. He begins to just walk with me down memory lane. And we just kind of pause in some places. And I look around and I'm like, oh gosh. I forgot about that. I can't believe I did that. I've swept that under the rug long ago. It takes me to, the, to what I thought was a filing cabinet. Turns out it was a full storage room. Finds the key. Opens it up. I'm walking through this. And, and listen. There's a couple of reasons he did this. First of all, if you're suppressing things that are actually true of your nature, things that are actually true about you, how can you expect God to, to heal you from it? If you're not willing to confront it, how can you expect God to do anything in it because you won't give any mental capacity to it? That's a, that's a message for, for another day. That's not the point of this. What happened also simultaneously is is. The Lord was taking off the rose-colored glasses that, that people who owe 50 coins happen to have on. And as we look at a full-length mirror of our, of our assessment of our soul, um, um, he just began to say, son, why don't you take those rose-colored glasses off? Why don't I give you a true picture of who you really are apart from me? I received one of the clearest words I've ever received in my life that day, that morning, spring of 07, Christ for the Nations, and the IB at the upper right-hand section of the altar. He said, the Holy Spirit said, and I'm not saying I heard it audibly. I've never had the pleasure of hearing the audible voice of the Lord. I'm just saying that I, had, I, I, I heard it in my heart, but it was for a healing in my mind. He said, Kirk, you are capable of every evil thing. I said, God, I'm capable of every evil thing. After having just went down a memory lane with the Holy Spirit, I wasn't too uh, willing at the moment to, to kind of come back at him and say, are, are you sure about that? I just said, yes, sir. And I accepted it and received that truth to be actually true for me. That apart from Jesus, I'm capable of every, every evil thing. In the preparation of this message, I revisited that with the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, is that true? Am I capable of every evil thing? I was willing and ready to receive it at Christ for the Nations because of that incredible moment with the Lord. But here I said, Lord, is that is that actually accurate? I mean, I, I grew up in a Christian home where we have set a high priority on, on actually following through with holiness and believing that God is good and believing that his morals and values are good for, for me. And I can't imagine that I would, would do these things. Can't imagine a scenario where that would actually happen. He said, I gave you your Christian home. I called your dad out at 25 years old. Apart from me, you are capable of every, 
every evil thing. So he confirmed it. That I am, in fact, capable of every evil thing. In Luke 7, there's this incredible thing that's happening. Because Jesus is giving this amazing parable. But what's actually happening in the parable is playing out real time. They're happening at the same time. It's incredible. I thought I was one that, was, that owed 50 coins. And Simon invites Jesus to his house and Simon accuses her that she doesn't belong in the presence of a prophet because she's a sinner but Simon invites Jesus to his house and Jesus accepts and Simon must be believing well it's because I am a good person Jesus has graced my home because I have tried to do the right things generally all the time I haven't made very many mistakes, so that's why a prophet is appropriate in my presence. Simon, with his 50 coins, points to the woman on the ground. What happened for me at Christ for the Nations is my perspective shifted. All of the sudden, I was no longer the one with 50 coins. God lifted off the lie of self-righteousness and said, you're not Simon. You're the woman on the floor. You owe 500 coins every single time. That's you. The problem was, I, the Lord says, this is who you are, but I thought I was over here. I, I, I'm the one, I'm positioning and posturing myself uh, to the Lord as though I don't owe a great debt. And therefore, there is self-righteousness and, and spiritual pride that is there that is preventing me from a true and real moment with Jesus. I belong here. But I'm standing over there with my arms crossed. And from time to time, I go like this. You See that? I would never do that. I belong in this church because, you know, I, I, do, I do the right thing most of the time. I'm generally a good person. No. No. There is none that is good. Not one. And the, 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 the spectrum on which you place yourself is the difference. I used to mark myself that I was about right here in my righteousness and my own goodness and my own, my own introspective um, uh, endeavor to mark where I am. I would mark myself right here. I'm pretty good. I generally try to do the right thing. And then in that moment at Christ for the Nations, the Holy Spirit began to, to bring me down to where I actually was and simultaneously began to tell me that, that the gauge by which I was, uh, I was uh, evaluating my standard was wrong. What are you doing uh, uh, even marking yourself? How can you go about marking yourself? Relative moralism? How are you supposed to do that? Well, because this person did that thing, that way it bumps me up a little bit. Why is gossip so rampant? Because we're eager to hear the bad things somebody else did so we can feel better about the things that we do. God said that, you're, why are you even looking at that standard? He said, here's the real standard. It's the pure and spotless Lamb of God. What's the actual standard that he's gonna judge the earth by? It's the perfection of Jesus. If your self-imposed mark is here, Jesus' mark is out of sight. And it's in the disparity of those two marks. That is when you begin to see and come to the sobering moment that you are not good.
It's not until you've grasped this truth in a personal way, in a way that I actually believe this is true about myself. Kirk, you're capable of every evil thing. It's a truth that I accepted and actually believe with all my heart. It's not until you've done that that you can tap into the endlessly emotional, tear-filled joy that is associated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not until you've accepted it that you can be happy about being found because you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you were in fact lost. You can't be enthusiastic about about being a new creation in God unless you agree with God that your old self needs to pass away. You're not propping your old self up with 50 coins. You can't be excited about heaven until you know you were hell bound. You see, the issue is the reason we cannot let this fundamental doctrine of our faith pass away. We cannot, we have to fight for this truth is because it is the context of the gospel. If you take a bright light out of the context of darkness and and sort of in your own imagination, bring it into a lit room, what good does that do? The context of the Bible, the the context of, of the gospel rather, is this doctrine. That you are not good. And that nobody is good. Paul goes on to say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can't let it, we we have to, to fight for this as a church. You have to install it into your heart. And when you do, it's a powerful thing. All of a sudden, it's not hard to bring about a genuine and authentic uh, moment of praise and worship every single Sunday morning. Some people are like, how are these people so enthusiastic every single Sunday morning? I don't get it. It's because they know that they were dead in their trespasses. How can these ladies get up here and be all so enthusiastic every single time? It's because they understand the context of the gospel and they've received it to be true of their their own life. Not propping themselves up with self-righteousness. But they're like the woman on the ground. It's easy to get excited and enthusiastic about being in the presence of God. It's easy. Whenever you understand the context of the Bible, of the gospel. Don't be at risk of falling into giving an empty, half-hearted offering of praise and worship to the Lord. Rather, accept this foundational truth that apart from Jesus, you're not good. Psalms 96. Psalms 96, we read a psalm of David. A man who has this truth firmly planted in his life. This truth that there is none that is good, not one. It's firmly established in his life. And here we see a glimpse of an appropriate response from somebody who understands the context. Psalms 96 says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. <laughs> there, it's not hard to get excited about what the Lord has done for you when you know where he's brought you from. I'm not gonna bring the, to the Lord an old worn out song that ha- that's lost its meaning to me long ago that has just has this sort of uh, habit forming thing in me. It's this sort of ritual type thing. I'm not gonna bring an old song. I'm gonna bring a new song because he's doing new things in my life. And I wanna, I wanna fully express the genuine gratitude of my heart to my king and my savior. I'm gonna bring a new song. 
Sing to the Lord a new song. Oh, sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Listen, watch this one. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all people. Why? Because they need it. If you don't have this truth firmly established in your life, you're at risk of never being obedient to Jesus' command to share your faith. Why? Because if it's not in your life, if you don't have it, you'll fail to see the urgency of the hour. If you bring a bright light into a light room, you don't really see the point of it. You'll fail to see the urgency. Without a personal understanding of it, you'll, you'll also lack the motivation and inspiration to share it. You get excited whenever you understand what God's done for you. And it brings about motivation. It brings about an inspiration to share what God has done for you because you have an accurate reflection of who you were apart from him. You'll lack the motivation and inspiration, and you'll fail to see the urgency and the need that others have for him. It's a double-edged sword that cuts down evangelism in America today. You might be wondering how I could possibly say that I know that King David had this truth firmly established in his life. I would take you back to Romans 3, and I would show you that he's actually quoting an Old Testament verse. In, Old, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, uh, he is quoting, more specifically, an Old Testament psalm of David. Psalms 14, 1. Let's read it. Psalms 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Keep going. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupted. There is no one who does good, not one. You see, the Lord established this truth in David's life early on. It's how I know that when we read Psalms 96, it comes from a place that, of a man who understands the context and sees the truth and the reality of what the situation in the earth is. And it's a vital truth. It's almost, it's almost as like God, God is saying, you can't let go of this. You want to know why? Because he reestablishes it in David's heart. There is, a, there is a philosophy of an age that is railing against this, that's wanting to cut down this truth. And, and it's almost as if God is saying, no, you cannot let go of this, David, because not only does he establish it in his heart in, in, in Psalms 14, but guess what happens all over again in Psalms 53? It's the same thing once again. You can't let go of this. The exact same verse from Psalms 14, 1 through 3 is the same thing as Psalms 53, 1 through 3. And it happens again in the New Testament, Romans 3, 10 through 13. God is saying, you can't let go of this. It is the context of the good news. Praise God. I want to ask the worship team to come forward as we, as, we, as we finish today. I 
I'm not, I didn't bring this to make you feel bad. I promise. I really didn't. The Lord put this on my heart because it, because it is a doctrine of our faith that we have to have firmly established in our life. I'm not here to make you feel bad about yourself. Uh, you're, when you have Jesus, uh, that's, this is when the whole good news becomes the good news. <laughs> this is when it is. This is I, I did all this work to set up the, the condition of the earth apart from Jesus. The condition of the corruption of your soul when you don't have Jesus so that you might be able to fully embrace the good news of the Lord. Y'all just begin to play just as soon as you can. You see, the full gospel includes this context. The full gospel includes it. I like that Paul uses the word righteousness when he's quoting the Old Testament scripture. None is righteous, not one. The good news is that Jesus met you in in your most corrupted state. Jesus came to where you were completely hopeless, completely lost, in the pit and he extended his hand to you and says if you'll follow me I'll show you a way out it's the good news it's the gospel he made atonement for your mistakes he he served for your he served for your punishment the wages of sin is death he took that death upon himself so that you wouldn't have to die for your sins That is the gospel. But here's the part I really want us to drill down on. Because it's the very thing we've been talking about all day. We've been talking about your goodness or lack thereof. We've been talking about your righteousness or lack thereof. When you receive the free gift of salvation, what comes with it is this very important phrase that I want you to add to your Christian glossary. I want you to understand this. You received the imputed righteousness of Jesus. In other words, whenever God looks to judge you, he doesn't look at your failed righteousness. Rather, he looks at the righteousness of Jesus and he credits it to your account. (laughs) He credits Jesus' righteousness to your account. And here's the important word. I said imputed, okay? Now, to help you understand it, I'm going to bring about another word to help you understand what that means. Um, The Lord imparts his gifts and the fruits. He imparts those to you. That means that you have a part in it. You, You collaborate with God with the gifts that he's imparted to you. But when it's imputed, when an imputation has nothing to do with you. God handles all of the ecosystem and all of the things that go together to make, uh, that makes Jesus righteous. He handles it all. He, 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 he protects it all. He pastors it all. And you have nothing to do with it. He protects your righteousness. And he credits it to your account. We receive the imputation of that righteousness only by faith. Why? So that no one can boast. I was having a conversation with the, actually uh, Zena and Joseph and I were having a conversation with a a delightful group of about three or four uh, Muslim men. We were in um, uh, Dusseldorf, Germany, and these guys were street performers, and they were kind of on a break, I guess. And we just started to talk to them about Jesus. And um, as the conversation very quickly did, I would simply say, how do you get into heaven? Actually, um, I said, how do you get into paradise? Just as a way to bridge a gap. How do you get into paradise? 
And the, one of the young gentlemen on the, on the seat, he says, man, it's like, a, it's like an uphill climb. You just always got to be doing your very best. And it's like you just got to rail against this hill. You got to climb it and do your very best every single day. And I said, can I tell you, can I tell you about Jesus? Because I want to tell you that the whole point about the gospel of Jesus has nothing to do with what you do. It's simply accepting what he's done. And no matter what you do, as long as you have accepted what he's done, it's finished. It's, it's done. You're, you're going to heaven. And he said, no, 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 no. We can't, that can't be the case. The main, the main speaker of the group. No, that can't be true. If that were true, people would go hog wild. They would go crazy, fulfilling every single urge and tendency that they might have. They would, they would do every evil thing. And I said, whenever you've been born again into the kingdom of God, you receive a gift of repentance. Let me tell you what this gift does for you. It gives you an accurate picture of what sin is. No longer do you have the desire to pursue sin and the lust because you see it for what it is as the destructive force of the devil. You accurately see what sin is and what it does. It, it, it comes to lie, kill, and destroy, kill, steal, and destroy. And it, and it is constantly eroding at everything that is good inside of you. You do away with that sin. You see it. The, the, the gift of repentance lifts the blinders off regarding sin. And all of a sudden you have the desire to actually love God and follow his commandments. It's so hard for these guys to accept that to be true. Meanwhile, while this main, the main speaker of the group um, is, is talking, the guy that said about the uphill battle, he jumps up off of his seat and uh, this time the, the speaker's talking to, to Joseph, I think, and the guy comes around to my left and he taps me on the shoulder with hungry eyes. He says, how many times a day do you have to pray? And it's kind of funny in a way, but my heart broke. I said, I don't have to pray at all. I, I don't have to pray. And that's the honest to God's truth. I don't have to pray. But I get to. I get to. I get to share this life that my creator has given me with the creator. And, and he, he is so generous enough to offer to lead me. The one that knows the end from the beginning. The one that knows the actual purpose of my life. He's actually offered to lead me. How incredible is that? Talk about a second and third layer of the good news of the gospel of Jesus. As we finish, I just want to ask you if you're, if you're willing to stand as we, as we pray. The context of the gospel cannot be lost or forgotten because we would be at risk of believing a cheap and incom incomplete gospel. We'd be at risk of the heresy of universalism. We'd be at risk of repeatedly falling into a half-hearted lip service style uh, worship to the almighty and, all, uh, and completely holy God. And we'd be at risk of never being obedient to share Jesus' commandment, to share Jesus' gospel because, because we lack the motivation to do so. I want to let the Holy Spirit do just a quick work in your heart. I just want to say, I want to, I want to encourage you just in this moment to say, Holy Spirit, have I been viewing myself in the wrong way? Have I been propping myself up and being 
spiritually prideful? Have I been misappropriating the true condition of my soul apart from you, Jesus? Lord, have I, have I allowed your, your compassion that you gave so freely of in my life, have I allowed that to, to cause me to judge your command, to, to judge your uh, judgments on the earth? To judge you? To be at offense and at odds with you, God? Holy Spirit, I pray that you just begin to confront lies that have been accepted in, the, in this congregation right now in Jesus' name. Begin to call them out in their hearts. These accepted lies, the spirit of this age. Call them out in Jesus. I just, I just put, call them out in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, begin to heal that. Install truth in their vacancies. Holy Spirit's doing a work. I want to also invite you to the front as we have an opportunity to, to, to go deeper and to go further, to go to that next place of receiving what the Lord has for you. Maybe you're here today and, and you need prayer for something that honestly has nothing to do with what we're talking about, and that's totally okay. We want to pray with you. Maybe you need a supernatural healing. Maybe you didn't respond during our incredible time of worship and you wish you had of. You wish you would have. Here's an opportunity. Do it here. Do it now. So I'm going to pray a quick, simple prayer. And if you need prayer for anything at all, I want you to come forward and receive it. Holy Spirit, pray you confront lies. Pray you install truth in their vacancies. Holy Spirit, I pray you would call everyone forward who needs prayer for anything at all. In Jesus' name, amen.